All right, amen. How is everybody today? If you're good, say yeah. yeah. All right, it's great to see those at our Park Avenue campus. Great to have those that are with us online as always, those watching this later in the week. Thank you so much for remaining connected in this season. I can't tell you how important that is that we all re remain connected together in this season. So thanks so much for tuning in. And we pray that, uh, that you interact today just like the people that are here are interacting. Uh, you know, um, lift your hands and, and worship and respond. There's ways for you to chat and respond on any of our venues that you're watching on right now digitally. And so just want you to be engaged. Uh, and I think that's a really important thing to do. If you have your Bibles online, if you have your Bibles in the room, let's get those out. Who's got your Bible? Say me. Okay, good. Grab that Bible and open it up to Luke chapter 4, and then put a, put a piece of paper there, your thumb there, and also flip to Exodus chapter 13. Exodus chapter 13 and Luke chapter 4. Exodus is in the front. Luke is somewhere close to the middle toward the end, middle end, all right? I'll give you a second to find that. We're going to read a lot out of Luke chapter 4 here in a minute, but I want to read two verses out of Luke chapter 4 that get us going. Even if you're not there yet, you can put your attention to the screens for just a moment. And I'm going to read Luke chapter 4 verse 1 and Luke chapter 4 verse 14. 1 and 14. It reads as follows. Luke chapter 4 verse 1 says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Everybody say wilderness. He was led into the wilderness. Luke chapter 4 verse 14 tells us what happens when he came out. Jesus returned from the wilderness into Galilee in the power of the Spirit and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. So today I want to talk to you about leaving the wilderness in power. Leaving the wilderness in power. Let's pray together. Father, we ask that you come in your spirit right now and that you speak to us, that you encourage us, and that you indeed empower us. We're in a unique season, Lord, and we know that you are doing something incredible in this season and you wish to do something very incredible in the lives of every person here and every person watching. May we not waste this season. I think you want to do something very unique. So teach us today, Lord. Encourage us. Open our eyes and show us the opportunities that are before us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. All right, Luke chapter 4, we have a very historic event here that's being told to us. It's given us the details of what happened after Jesus' baptism. So Jesus, after his baptism, after this moment, his baptism was a little bit different than our baptism. Our baptism is a moment where we turn from sin and turn toward God. It is a moment where we, um, we give ourselves to the Lord and we let the, the world know that that has happened. This was not a sin-turning moment for Jesus. He had no sin to turn from. But this was a moment where he was publicly uh, acknowledging his devotion to God. Very powerful moment where the, the, the word of the Father booms from heaven. The Spirit falls upon him. So Jesus is filled with the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit in this moment, and then he was led by the Spirit of God from the baptism, not into the temple. I think it's often that we get baptized and we think the next thing that the Lord should do is to promote us to public ministry. I'm, I'm, I know the Lord now, it's, it's, it's time, but, but you know, if, if we had anything to do with it, we would promote ourselves a lot quicker than the Lord does, Right? I should be CEO now. I, I, I just got Jesus, and, and the world is going to know him very soon. Now, I like that attitude, and God likes that attitude. But the place that the Spirit of God led Jesus was not to the temple. It wasn't directly into ministry. It was into the wilderness. The Spirit led him into the wilderness. And what happened in the wilderness was very important the wilderness throughout Scripture is a term that often means dry place, remote place, isolated place, challenging place, difficult place, a place that's seemingly void 
of life. Raise your hand if you've ever been in the wilderness. Yeah? I've been there many times. I think I could give tours. I'm so familiar with this place. The wilderness is a place that's physically and spiritually, let's just be honest, it's a difficult place to be. Most of us try really hard to avoid places like this. I know I do. I don't want to, if somebody invites you, hey, you want to go to the wilderness? Unless it's like the wilderness lodge at Disney, the answer is no, right? Right? You want to go to the, no. No, and, and, and if we do find ourselves in these places, whether it's physically or spiritually, we fight hard to get out as quickly as possible. It's human nature to avoid difficulty. It's human nature to avoid challenges. It's human nature to avoid crisis. Like God, end this and end this now, right? And we also think that if we are in the wilderness as a people or as a person, it's due to a wrong turn or punishment. Did Jesus do anything wrong? It's, it's an easy answer. Did he do anything wrong? No, he didn't do anything wrong. He wasn't being punished. Now, there is a wilderness. Don't, don't, don't hear me say that there's not a wilderness of unbelief or an, a, a wilderness of that you can go to due to sin. And that's a bad place. It's not a place that I wish upon anyone. It's a place that, that, it, that is hopeless, a wilderness of unbelief where I willingly turn away from the Lord. I willingly turn away from his goods. I willingly turn away from everything that he's telling me to do. And I can take myself and position myself in a self-appointed wilderness. And self-appointed wildernesses are not good places to be. But there are some God-appointed wilderness that are actually not only helpful in the season that you're in, but can prove very helpful for the seasons that are ahead. And this is what was going on here. God often takes people, as we'll see, not only in this passage, but many other passages, God often takes people into the wilderness before he unveils them to the world. It's a God-appointed wilderness, and I feel that maybe some of us feel like we're there right now, and if you're not there right now, odds are you may find yourself there in a season ahead. And so I would encourage you to take some notes as we talk about the wilderness today. It's not going to be all bad. Look at your neighbor and say, it's not going to be that bad. It's going to be helpful. It's going to be helpful. So let me, let's, let's get a working definition for wilderness. I found this one this week. I like it. A wilderness, just spiritually, is a liminal or in-between space where ordinary life is suspended, revelation is given, and new challenges and possibilities emerge. Does that sound familiar? An in-between space where ordinary life is suspended, revelation is given, and new challenges and possibilities emerge. In Scripture, Wilderness encounters, they're all throughout scripture. I did a lot of studying on the wilderness this week. And these wilderness encounters often happen at a critical juncture in someone's life or ministry or in the history of God's people. So I want want to repeat that. Wilderness situations often happen at a critical juncture, meaning something significant is about to happen. And so these wilderness moments happen in this critical juncture right before something very significant is about to happen. You find these wilderness moments. We see it in the life of Moses. He is in the wilderness before God does something incredible in his life. He calls him out of the wilderness, get this, to only lead him back into the wilderness for 40 years. But his first wilderness experience set him up for success in the second wilderness experience. And a lot of people say, well, Moses wasn't successful. I beg to differ. He was very successful. He was the one who mentored Joshua. He played a big part in getting the people of Israel into the promised land. Amen? If it wasn't for Moses, Joshua probably would not have had the success that he had. Moses was the one that taught Joshua how to meet with the Lord face to face. So Moses was prepped in the desert. David, before killing Goliath, his only experience was that from the wilderness. 
tending sheep in the wilderness, tending sheep in the desert. Matter of fact, when, when he came to fight Goliath, not knowing that he would be fighting Goliath, his brothers ridiculed him and said, you're not a soldier. The only training you have is that of tending sheep in the wilderness. It's the only experience that you have. And yet it seems to me that maybe that that experience alone is enough. Because it was a wilderness boy, a wilderness shepherd that defeated the giant and cut off his head. Elijah, while in the wilderness, in an uninhabited land, was fed by God, ministered to by God, nurtured by God, given revelation by God. He emerges from the wilderness and then wins the greatest battle of his life. One of the greatest battles in Old Testament history, where he calls down fire from heaven. John the Baptist, in the wilderness, John received revelation of Jesus and how to prepare the way for Jesus. And here we find in Luke chapter 4, Jesus himself was led from a wonderful place, from a ministry high moment into the wilderness. Are you seeing this? There's nothing appealing about the place. There's no perks or upgrades. There's no mattress toppers in the wilderness. No one's rushing to get in and everybody's rushing to get out. But maybe, just maybe, especially in the season that we're in right now, some might categorize it as a wilderness. Before we rush to get out, before we say, God, end this and end this now. God, take us back to our normal. Maybe, just maybe, God wants us to pause and say, hey, why don't you look around and see if I have something for you here that you need very much for the season ahead? Matter of fact, I want you to think about this. Jesus himself often went back to the wilderness by choice. Luke chapter 4, verse 42. Luke chapter 5, verse 16. It says that he would often withdraw from normal life to go to lowly places. That, say, that word can also be translated the wilderness. Some scholars think that he went back to the same place. So maybe, just maybe, Jesus found something in the wilderness that he knew had great value for ministry ahead. So I want you to flip over now to Exodus chapter 13. I want to show you a place where God leads his children, his people into the wilderness. And I think it gives us some insight as to why God often does this. Exodus chapter 13. This is another wilderness story. God has delivered them from the hand of Pharaoh. Pharaoh has let them go, and now it's time to go to the promised land. They are going to the promised land. Now, if, if we were to get out our phones today and, and type in promised land, okay, let's say that was a real place, our GPS would give us options, right? Siri would say, are y'all with me? You can go this way, seven hours and 23 minutes. You can go this way, nine hours and 42 minutes. Or you can go, you know, scenic, desert, or direct route, two hours and 12 minutes. Raise your hand if you pick option C, two hours and 12 minutes. Okay? Yeah, most. The direct route is the route that we want. The quickest way to get there. All right, that, that's what we want. That's the culture, that, and I get that. I'm the same way. But look at this, Exodus chapter 13, verse 17. It says, when fi Pharaoh finally let the people go, God did not lead them along the main road that runs through the Philistine territory, even though it was the shortest, quickest, direct route to the promised land. So he didn't take them on the easy path. God said, no, I can't do that, because if the people are faced with a battle, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. If they face difficulties on this main road, which they probably would have, they might choose to go back into bondage. See, it's often when Christians, especially baby Christians or immature Christians, when faced with life's difficulties, choose to go back into bondage. 
So God being a good father, not wanting that for his children, says, okay, I'm I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to take them into the wilderness. So God led them in a roundabout way through the what? The wilderness toward the Red Sea. And thus, because of this, because of this wilderness route, the Israelites left Egypt like an army ready for battle. It was because of this decision that the Lord made. Now, this is an interesting time in history. This is a time in history where God was the one who was fighting all of Israel's battles. He was the one that was um, divinely delivering them. He was the one performing miracles. He was the one that single-handedly defeated Pharaoh. He was the one who got them out. So their victories up until this point were solely based on the favor of God. But God shows us something here. Even though he was completely capable of defeating any army that they might face on any route, any of those routes, is God capable of defeating the Philistines? Yes or no? Yeah, he was completely capable of defeating the Philistines, of defeating Egypt on that short path. Whoever they would have met, he could have defeated them. But he knew, get this, that his role in the battle could and would be limited by their fear. God is always capable of defeating any enemy that we may or may not face. But if we choose in that moment to partner with fear and not with God, we'll be defeated. And he said, they're not mature enough to stand against this army. They're not mature enough yet for this one. They need some time with me. They need to get to know me. They need, they need more faith. So we need to buy some time. We're not going to take the two-hour route. We're going to take the nine-hour route. Because they need to spend some time with me in the wilderness before we step into battle. And so that's what happened. He takes them on a different route. And in that season... He speaks to them. He shows them his nature. He shows them his goodness. We don't know how long that season is, but let's say, let's say it was a month. Let's say, well, let's say it was four months. He spends time with them, and then he takes them to a very specific place. Out of the wilderness, to the Red Sea, directly into battle with Egypt and the Pharaoh again. And what was the difference? What was the difference in this time and the time previous? Just one simple thing. You ready? They were ready. The wilderness readied them for the battle that they were about to face. A month ago, no, nah, they're not ready yet. It's not time, but after a season of, ha- get this, after a season of handling the wilderness well, God decided they're now ready. They're now ready. So God determines when readiness is appropriate and when that is is a reality in our life. And it really has everything to do with how we handle not the good times, not the easy times, not the good situations, not the easy things. It has everything to do with how we handle what is difficult. How you handle the wilderness will determine how long you are in the wilderness, how many times you come back to the wilderness, and how you come out of the wilderness. Really important. All right, so how can we navigate this season well? All right, let's go back to Luke chapter 4. All right, go back to Luke chapter 4. Let's see how Jesus navigated this. Let's see what he dealt with. You know, Israel stayed in the wilderness for, for 40 years. Jesus, 40 days. Who wants 40 days over 40 years? Anybody? (laughs) Okay. Me too. Luke chapter 4. Let's just start in verse 1 again. Starting in verse 1. It says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days. I love it says at the end he was hungry. Which leads me to believe that in the midst, he was not. 
But it says at the end, he got hungry. At the end of the 40 days. Now, I don't know if he was not hungry, but I think that's a very interesting thing. I, I, I believe personally that God, like he did with Elijah, like he did with others, like he did with the children of Israel with manna, that, that, that he was nourishing Jesus during this 40-day fast. The devil came to him during this time that he was hungry, and he said, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up then to a high place and showed him an instant all of the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I'll give you all of their authority and splendor because it's been given to me and I'll give it to anyone I want to. If you'll worship me, it'll be yours. And Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. The devil then led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. He said, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all of these temptings and testings, he left him until an opportune time had arised. Okay, all right, so, so from this, we see certain things that happen in the wilderness, and I want you to be aware of all of these things, okay? Because I think a lot of these things are before us even now, even in this season. The first thing is the wilderness is often a place where we are tested, where we're tested. Raise your hand if you like a test. Anybody like tests, test taking? Okay, a few, a few of your good test takers. I always, I always use this line. I'm not dumb, I just don't test well. Anybody partner with me? Where's my C and D brothers and sisters? Okay, all right. Yeah, I'm not dumb, I just don't test well. Who likes a test? Look at Deuteronomy 8, 2 on the screen here. This is the verse that Jesus quoted at the devil. It says the following. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble you and what? Test you. In order to know what was in your heart. So he tested them to know what was truly in your heart. Whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then fed you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. So that's the verse that Jesus quoted. It's interesting that he chose this verse. But by referencing this passage, Jesus, Jesus was essentially saying to the devil, I understand two things about my purpose in this wilderness. I understand that this is a test to reveal what's in my heart, to reveal which true and untrue. And I also understand that no matter what you try to feed me, it's garbage compared to what the Lord wants to feed me. So the wilderness, it's wilderness moments, it's wilderness seasons that expose what is true and false of us. What is real and what is fake. It's easy to fake when times are good. It's easy to be a Christian when there is zero pressure. It's easy to be a Christian and to be Christ-like when there's no trials, where there's no pressure. It's easy to be a Christian when you're in the Caribbean. It's hard to be a Christian when you're in the Sahara. And so one of the reasons, one of the things that happens in the wilderness is you are tested to assess why this is not this is not God saying well I need to test you this is not an angry God testing us this is a loving father placing us in a situation to check our readiness for the destiny that he has before us it is an unloving God to not check your readiness and then lead you into something you're not ready for yet no one takes their child who's learning to swim and throws them in an ocean. I can't swim yet. Off you go. The undertow is a good one today. Hope you figure it out. 
No, we put them in still bodies of water, in calm water, in order to teach them. So, so what's being tested when we're in the wilderness? Oh my goodness, there's so much being tested. Your heart is being tested. Your heart's being tested. Do you have a true love for God and a true love for people? And again, this is not disciplinary. God just wants to see where your heart is. Your soul is being tested. Oh my goodness, do you have a healthy, healed soul? Because if you don't, in the wilderness, all the wounds come out. Attitude is being tested. Oh my goodness, don't look at your neighbor. Your attitude is being tested in the wilderness. Is your attitude completely based off of good circumstances? Can you only have a good attitude in good circumstances? Or are you a person that chooses joy amidst any circumstance? Your faith is being tested. Do you trust God in a season where you can't see anything but dirt and camels? (laughs) Do you trust him in a season where fear is abound? And uncertainty is being broadcast at every single level. Your ears are being tested. What are you hearing? Who are you hearing? Blessed are those who have ears and hear. That's what Jesus said. Your eyes are being tested. Can you see what God is doing in the midst of what seems to be dryness and chaos? Your devotion is being tested. What and who do you truly love? It's often that idols are exposed in the wilderness. They took away church. No, it's not a big deal. We've got online. They took away football. (laughs) But I've got season tickets. I give more to Tuscaloosa than I do the Lord. Let's move on. (laughs) Number two, the wilderness is a place we are tempted. We're tempted. Satan came after Jesus in the wilderness. And get this, this is going to mess with your theology. God led him. God led him. Satan once came to to Jesus and said, I'm coming after Peter. I'm going to sift him. And God said, go ahead. Go ahead. Why would he do that? Satan tempted him. He, he, He tempted him in three areas, and this is where you're always going to be tempted. He tempted him to satisfy himself, self provision. There's always a temptation for you to be your own provider. I want to say that again. There's always a temptation for you to step into the position of being your own provider. Well, how do I know if I've stepped into that position? It's pretty easy to see. One who has stepped into the position of being on provider trusts God with very little and trusts self with everything. You say things like this, I'm not going to give, I'm not going to tithe, because if I do, then this may or may not happen. One of the, the number one reason that most people don't give is not because they don't love the Lord, it's because they don't trust the Lord. And I, so, so at that point, I've become, when, when I don't trust the Lord with my wealth, with my income, I have stepped into the position of self-provider. I've said, thanks, but no thanks, God, I can handle this myself. I'm pretty smart. I work really hard, and I'm going to go, I I, I, I appreciate your offer to help, but I'm going to self-provide. And so this was a temptation. Oh, you're hungry, you want bread? Then make your own bread. You can do that, and he could have. But Jesus said, no, that's a trick. I'm not biting that one. The Lord is my provider. He was tempted to compromise in a moment of difficulty. And all of us will be tempted to compromise our values, compromise what we believe, compromise what is true, especially in seasons of difficulty and in the wilderness. And then he tempted him with pride. Oh my goodness. 
That pride is a sneaky one. He says, oh, okay. You're the son of God. Do something amazing. Do something God would be proud of. Jump off. Save yourself. And then he used scripture to back it up. Don't you know that Satan knows scripture? Unfortunately, Satan knows scripture better than most Christians. It's what he did in the garden. He twisted the words of God. And it's often in seasons of wilderness that we'll twist the words of God to do ministry in ways that God never asked us to do, to do things that we were never appointed to do, to do things that we weren't ready to do. And that was pride. Because I'm here to tell you, ministry with the wrong motives always ends in disaster. Always ends in disaster. You see, the devil knows the implications of us faithfully and successfully navigating the wilderness. I'll say that again. He knows the implications of people successfully and faithfully navigating the wilderness. He knows that if you successfully and faithfully navigate the wilderness, that the reward will be more of God. Empowerment, gifts, resources, blessings for the kingdom. And the last thing that he wants is for you to successfully navigate the hard places. So he's going to throw every temptation that he can possibly throw in your way to get you to fail. Because he doesn't want you coming out of the wilderness like Jesus. He doesn't want you coming out of this strong. He wants you to come out defeated. But be encouraged. I want you to be encouraged. No matter what temptation has come your way, no matter what temptation is coming your way, God always gives you an out. Even now, if you find yourself in the midst of falling to temptations, I want you to be encouraged by this verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. The temptations in your life are no different than what others experience, and God is faithful. Matter of fact, let's say that together. God is faithful. He's faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. I hear that all the time. I just can't help it. I just can't help it. I'm not strong enough. If you are in Christ, that temptation has already been defeated. It's already been defeated. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. So the wilderness gives me an opportunity. Get this. This is hard. But the wilderness gives me an opportunity to crucify. Everybody say crucify. To crucify the unhealthy parts of me. And the parts of me specifically that should already be dead. So if you find yourself in a difficult place and you keep getting offended or you keep getting angry or you keep falling to lust or you keep falling to temptation, it's just simply a part of you that should have been dead a long time ago. So kill it. Crucify it. And come out of the flesh. I mean, yeah, come come out of the flesh, but also come out of the wilderness. A person that has been raised to life in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? All right, and the wilderness is a place, we're starting to get to some good stuff. Look at your neighbor and say, it's about to get good. Yeah, it's about to get good. All right, the wilderness is a place where you can be nourished. Okay, we see that. Hosea chapter 2. I know that the Revelation verse is the next one I have in the notes, but see if you can find that Hosea chapter 2 verse for them. I probably skipped it. Hosea chapter 2, it's it's describing the bride and the bridegroom. It's it's, it's describing a relationship between a husband and a wife. But it's also how God shows us our relationship with him. So it's symbolic. And so it's talking about a real situation, but showing us a picture of what, how God sees us. And it says, talking about this unfaithful wife, it says, I'm going to now allure her. I'm going to lead her into the wilderness and speak to her with discipline. Huh? Speak to her because, hey, you messed up. You've cheated on me. No, I'm going to speak to her tenderly. And there in the wilderness, I will give her back her vineyards. I will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. That was a very bad place. So it's referencing a very terrible place. I'm going to make this terrible place a great place. He's talking about restoration. 
I'm going to take her into the wilderness, and there, in this bad place, I'm going to restore. And there she will respond to me as in the days of her youth, when we were in love, as in the day that she came up out of Egypt, having full trust in me. You seeing this? So, so this is hope for anybody that may have slipped in their journey, anybody that may be falling right now, anybody that may just would say, honestly, I'm just not proud of where I'm in my relationship with God. Okay, you're in this dry place, but look at the opportunity in this dry place. There's an opportunity for the Lord to speak gently to you and tenderly to you, reminding you of the love that you once had. That's for somebody. So if you find yourself in this place, just see right there in Scripture, he's not mad He's not disappointed. He wants to speak to you tenderly in this season, reminding you of the love that you once had and maybe the love that could be. But you've got to make that decision. You've got to make that decision to come to him. In the wilderness, we can be, be, if we want to be, we can be encouraged and empowered. We can be encouraged and empowered. A couple of verses from Isaiah. Isaiah is full of wilderness verses that result in really awesome things. Isaiah 35 says, the wilderness and the dry land will. Everybody say will. It will be joyously glad. The desert will blossom like a rose and rejoice. Every dry and barren place will burst forth with abundant blossoms. Dancing and spinning with delight. Lebanon's lush splendor covers it. The magnificent beauty of Carmel and Sharon. My people will see the awesome glory of Yahweh, the beautiful grandeur of God. So strengthen those who are discouraged. Come on, everybody. Strengthen those who are discouraged. Energize those who feel defeated. Energize those who are wishing that we could push reset on 2020. Right? Oh, this is just a horrible year. No, what if it's a year of wilderness? <laughs> So energize those who feel today. Say to the anxious and to the fearful, be strong, never afraid. Look, here comes your God. He's breaking through to give you victory. What started in a wilderness can end in victory if you'll participate with God's words and not the world's words. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3 says, A voice of one calling says the following. It says, in the wilderness, when you're in the wilderness, prepare the way. Prepare the way. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for God. So if you find yourself in a wilderness, get ready. Get prepared for what? Verse 4, every valley, every low place that you're currently experiencing will be raised up. Every mountain, every obstacle will be made low. The rough ground shall become level. The rugged places a plain. So get ready. Ready, get ready, get ready. Because if you'll do that, if you'll participate with him, things start to happen. Verse 5, the glory of the Lord will be revealed and the people will see it together. And I love this last verse. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. What does that mean? Because he said these things are going to happen, they're going to happen. The word of God does not fail. Are y'all with me? (laughs) When he speaks, this is what he expects. He expects for you to partner with those words. And he's spoken over you. He's spoken over your marriage. He's spoken over your life. He has spoken words of healing. He's spoken words of deliverance. He's spoken words over our nation. He's spoken words over our state. He's spoken words over our city. He has spoken words over this church. He's spoken over you. He's made you promises, and you've heard those promises. And you may be in a place right now where you're thinking, well, I just don't think it's going to happen. And that's exactly what your enemy wants you to believe. But his word has gone forth, and he's looking for people who will say, okay, I'll partner with that word. Come here, word of God. I'll partner with you. See, here's a truth that we cannot forget. The spoken word of of God is meant for us to boldly pursue and believe. And when we boldly pursue the word of God, it becomes an undefeatable weapon. His word goes out and his word will not be defeated. 
And the enemy knows this. That's why he doesn't want you to believe any of his words. He twists them. He tries to get you to believe lies. That's why Jesus himself said that persecution comes because of the word. What does that mean? Whenever someone hears the word of God and starts believing the word of God and starts pursuing the word of God, persecution comes. Because the enemy knows what happens when people believe God's words and start pursuing them. When the declared word of God starts to become impossible to us, I just can't get this. I'll never be able to meet those standards. When doubt and disappointment start to resonate in here, then what follows is compromise and fear and that word being choked out by weeds. So when God speaks something, he's inviting you on a journey. He's saying, come with me and experience yourself what you once thought was impossible, but now can be made possible because of God himself. So partner with me in this impossible word. Partner with me in this seemingly impossible calling. Partner with me in your destiny, the things that I've spoken over you. And you'll leave this arid, dry place, and you'll go into valleys that are full of blossoms, rivers and streams that are full of life. Partner with me. I always think about Mary. God gave her an impossible word. <laughs> hey, you're going to birth the Messiah as a virgin. <laughs> okay. How will this happen? Well, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and he will empower you and you will conceive, it's going to be pretty awesome. And Mary could have easily have said, okay, nope, no, I don't think so. But, the, it, but it, said, it said that she cherished the word in her heart. And she said, any word that comes from God, I will believe. May it be as you have said. And she cherished that word. On the flip, the word of God comes to Zechariah. Talking about John the Baptist. And his response was to laugh. Ha, 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 ha. And God said, shut your mouth. He did that strategically. He did not want Zechariah speaking negative, unfaithful words over the miracle that was about to be birthed. Are y'all seeing this? God has spoken. And he has said, it's time for revival. God has spoken. And he said, it's time to advance. This is not a season where we hunker down and survive. This is a season where we advance. Where we take what is God's. Where we take what he has promised. This is a season to arise and build, not hunker down. And hide. This is a season to train and deploy. This is a season to build and raise up an army. This is a, a time and a season for the kingdom to shine. And because he has spoken those things, this is what it means. He has given us every tool and resource necessary to dismantle what is evil and to usher in the kingdom. Because when he speaks, he also gives the resources to accomplish it. He doesn't just speak and say, okay, y'all go figure it out. With the word comes the anointing to accomplish it. Every time. So faith must arise in this season. If you want to navigate the wilderness correctly, if you want to navigate the wilderness faithfully, Faith must arise in this season. And this, no, your enemy's going to try to choke it out. Your enemy's going to try to tempt. Your enemy's going to try to do everything that he can to get you to believe that this season needs to be avoided. 
And this season's a waste. Twenty twenty should not be a wasted year for us. Man, I hope and pray 10, 20 years from now, I look back on 2020 and say, what a gift from God. What a gift. I'm not saying coronavirus came from God. Don't hear me say that. But what a gift from God that he used coronavirus to put everything on pause, to take us into the wilderness and speak tenderly to us. And to encourage us and to empower us and to say, don't believe everything you're hearing. Just listen to me. Listen to me. Follow me. And if you will, you'll come out of the wilderness empowered. Just like Jesus. I'll I'll tell you exactly how to do that in the next four weeks to come. Stand up. I want to pray over you today before you get out of here. Know that we do ministry at the end of every service. And so if you want prayer today, if you want a prayer of empowerment, you want a prayer of deliverance, you want a prayer of healing, you want a prayer for more, you know, I think that's what one of the major parts of this gathering should, should be for us to leave here different people. Amen? And God often accomplishes things through others. Not just through listening, but through moving. And so we'll give you an opportunity for ministry today. And if you want the person that's ministering to you to wear a mask or something like that, we completely understand that. And I'll be up here. I've got a mask available. I'll, I'll be happy to minister to you through that. So no, no shame, no, 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 nothing wrong with that at all. All right? I'm going to say a prayer for you. Appreciate your um, generosity in this season. Just know that it, you're, you're making a difference. We're, we've been able to do some amazing things in this season. And again, this, this is not, I don't think this is a season where our church just needs to financially survive. I think this is a season that God wants us to financially thrive in Jesus' name. And so I just want to speak that blessing not over, only over this house, but I would like to speak that blessing over you in this closing prayer as well, if that's okay. So I just want to speak that over you. I want you to bow your heads. If you feel comfortable, if you're watching online or even here, just open your hands. I just want to speak a blessing over you. So, Father, we ask that you come now. Come, Spirit of God. Come, Holy Spirit. And just encourage us. God, I know this season feels like a wilderness for many. And not just with virus and things changing and norms shifting. It it feels like a wilderness for some because of the personal situations that they're in. It just feels dry and arid. And I know our enemy has been speaking death over folks, over situations, and over relationships. God, will you help us to resonate in our heart? that you want us to come out of the wilderness, different folks, empowered by the Holy Spirit with life and love. So we ask God that you come now and that you move in great power, that you touch situations, that you touch individuals, that you touch bodies, that you touch emotions, that you completely heal and restore. God, if there's been any partnership with lies or words that we shouldn't listen to, we confess that now in the name of Jesus. We ask that you forgive us, and we ask that you restore us. We pray that you fill us with your spirit, and that you send us from this place brand new people. God, I pray a blessing over finances right now in the name of Jesus. God, I declare this house to be a Goshen. God, that in the midst of chaos, in the midst of a world of famine, that you will provide not only for this house, but you will provide for the houses represented. For those that are jobless or looking for jobs, I pray that you miraculously provide jobs in the name of Jesus. That you increase their income in the name of Jesus. God, increase their wealth in the name of Jesus. Not just for them, but so that they may be a blessing to so many. So God, as we receive our offerings... God, we pray that you just bless those who give you the first and give you the best. God, be with us as we go this week. Help us to be light and love. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Let's sing.